All right, we're back here at KPOO Studios in San Francisco, 89.5 FM. And if you can't tune in on a normal radio, then uh, KPOO.com is the best way to get a hold of us. And I'd like to say thank you to all the listeners that are uh, across North America, potentially in other parts of the planet as well, Europe, and uh, who knows? Who knows where people are listening? Bob Ingersoll is here. He's joined me for the second time on this radio show. Uh, I first found out about Bob on... The documentary Project Nim, which was a fascinating documentary, and if you haven't seen it, please go out and buy a copy. And also, if you have HBO, you're, you're in luck because it's going to be airing on December 20th. If you want to find out more about Bob Ingersoll, NimChimpsky.net, and also on Facebook uh, at NimChimpsky or no, it's Robert Ingersoll. I think is my my uh, personal uh, Facebook page is Robert Ingersoll, and then I have one that's Bob Ingersoll NimChimpsky, okay. which is a uh, you know a I guess, a public figure page or something. But either way, if you – well, this is how I got a hold of you. I sent that page a message and you replied. Right. It's it's fairly easy to find me. I'm pretty accessible, actually. I try to make myself accessible. You're very – I saw you just on your phone before you came in. You're you're doing that all the time. You must be. Yeah. uh, Well, there are a lot of people out there that want to know what's going on, and uh, it's a a critical time right now for chimpanzees in in captivity in the United States. So there are a lot of people that are really concerned, and and they're looking towards people like me as as a leadership in terms of how we're going to – solve this problem. Just just a quick recap for the people who haven't heard you before or are unfamiliar with you. Uh, there was a documentary called Nim or uh, Project Nim and it's about one of the most fascinating chimpanzees ever who learned sign language and communicated with humans through hand movements and then it's his story which is over 25 years. Right. And uh, you come in <clears throat> you come in about halfway through maybe a little bit before that. Right. And you take care of Nim for the for a good portion of his life, as well, much what, as you're able to. Nim comes back to the place where he was born after having been in New York for about four years. And, right. And it just so happened that I was working at the place where he was born with Roger Fouts and Sign Language Chimps. And uh, and that's where I met Nim. And and after that, I, I pretty much was involved at at least peripherally in the rest of his life and uh, and for the most part – uh, hands on so uh, and and you see a lot of that in the documentary. It pretty much is nim 's life story and uh, it, it tells about what happened to nim and it, it's kind of a cautionary tale about about what what 's up with animal research and and what goes on within you know behind those closed doors in research at, at least during that period of time and and right now chimpanzees are, are are kind of still caught in the crosshairs of that research question what should we do with chimps right so that's that 's in the documentary, it doesn't make that absolutely clear towards the end that that's kind of the big enemy is this is this clinical research stuff. But that's what you focus on is well, stopping that. Right. Well, well, the whole idea is that in the last twenty five years or so, we've we've come to the you know realization that chimpanzees are are not just little boxes or coke machines. They're they're living, breathing beings, and and they're you know so much like us that that uh, we we've really changed uh, philosophically as, as you know humans. Uh, we I think we've changed the way we view animals, you know, uh, you know, pretty dramatically. And so chimpanzees are, are you know, our closest relatives. And in, in, in the last 25 years or so, everyone except the United States has stopped medical research on chimpanzees. And really? All through no, Europe? Right. Wow. Uh, the U- European Union has, has, you know, not done chimpanzee, invasive chimpanzee research for over 10 years. Wow. So, uh, so it's just a matter of time. I mean, and, and right now, even at the, N- at the highest levels of the NIH, uh, the talk is that, that we should end this. The Institute of Medicine recently met and, and uh, came to the conclusion that chimpanzees were not necessary in invasive research, that it was probably immoral if if you know not at least unethical to use them in invasive research and uh so right now the problem the real problem is that there are 1000 chimps held by NIH and no place for them to go and and I think NIH would probably negotiate with whomever you know came up with a plan uh but generally with a plan you also have to have money and that's that's a real problem because retiring 1000 chimpanzees is going to cost Several hundred million dollars because they need places to stay. Right. Well, food, yeah. Right. All. Exactly. Uh, well, they'll first of all they have to have a, a facility that's right. built to house and to you know keep a thousand chimpanzees in in one place. So that's going to be fairly expensive. You know, a pretty a fancy prison, pretty much. You know, un- un- unfortunately, we're not going to be able to let these animals back out into the wild, but we can at least give them some sense 
uh, what I like to call the illusion of freedom. Why not? Why can't they go back into the wild? Well, well most of these animals are, are, are enculturated to humans or, or they're, they're in such a situation that, that they've had been exposed to hepatitis or, or to HIV or any on number. On purpose. Right, exactly, uh, on purpose. And, and so uh, it, it, it's just more ethical and, and it, it's more reasonable to think that what we should do is get these chimps to what I, I call a halfway house, which these sanctuaries tend to be, uh, a, a, go, a place that, that is better than research and in those Far labs. Better. It's bigger. They can be with other chimps. They can learn how, how to express their chimpanziness, let's say. But but the the chances of them existing and, and, and being able to make it in the wild – are are very very slim and right. and you know sending them back to Africa is, is not that could be a problem because they could carry these diseases with them correct and affect- correct and, and and immoral in the sense that we can't just drop them off in Africa and hope for the best that's I kind mean, of it's our responsibility to make sure that they thrive once we get them out of research right now you said there are about a thousand of these chimps that are imprisoned used for testing right now how many chimps in the world are there do you is there a number. Well, there's not a, a, an exact number, but let's say in 1930 there were between a half a million and three million chimpanzees. Right now there are probably under 100,000. So uh, chimpanzees are, are getting to the point now that uh, we're, we're talking extinct in, in our lifetimes, if not – you know, it, maybe not in my lifetime, but but soon they've been on the endangered list for. They're they're a definitely long time. on the endangered list uh, everywhere except for the United States. Which curiously, the reason why they're not on the endangered list in the United States, they're only considered threatened, is because they they were you they wanted to be uh, when when the decision was made to to the endangered species list in terms of chimps, uh, chimpanzees were still being used in research and in entertainment in the United States. So there, there's a split designation, uh, and, which is now also being talked about. The Fish and Wildlife Service is, is actually considering changing the designation of chimpanzees from threatened to endangered, which will change things dramatically, but it still won't help those 1,000. Now, you've been all across the United States and I'm assuming the world sharing this message and also sharing the film. Right. Where, where have you been recently? Where were some of the uh, well, places you've been? Uh, at the end of October, I was in uh, St. Louis at, uh, at a conference with a group called SANE, which is Stop Animal Experimentation Now. They put on a conference, the first one, I believe, uh, that was specifically to, uh, to address animal research and vivisection, which is the use of live animals in research. And so uh, I, I was invited to speak there, and I gave a couple of talks and, and uh, met some people that I'd not met before. And, and of course, I, I met and, and talked and gave presentations with a couple of friends of mine from over the years. And uh, so we were there for three days in St. Louis and actually participated in a little protest that, that uh, the local uh, St. Louis group is, is doing, uh, uh, I, I believe, the Vegans of St. Louis and a woman named Alex Graff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so it, it's a, a chance to network, to meet new people, and, and, and to, uh, to get the message out that, that what we're doing about chimps and chimp research. So... That was at the end of October. My assistant, Caitlin, and I went to that and attended that along with a number of other people. And uh, then at the uh, middle of November, I attended a, a, a conference in Tampa called NAPSA, which is the national – I mean the, the national uh, – uh, NAP, NAPSA – We'll oh, sorry. North American Primate Sanctuary Association. Got I it. get all those those acronyms all messed up. Right. But anyway, the North American Sanctuary Primate uh, Alliance. And that group, very recent group, was uh, uh, put together in order to uh, to deal with primate issues in sanctuaries, to, to have these sanctuaries, let's say, be accredited by another group called the uh, – Uh, another group, uh, a sanctuary, a global federation of animal sanctuaries, and and a number of of my old friends were attending this meeting as well. Uh, people from Save the Chimps, the Center for Great Apes, Patty Reagan, from Save the Chimps, Jen Feinstein, and uh, a, a number of other folks that are concerned about chimps that actually run sanctuaries across the United States. Uh, and, and then we took a visit to the Center for Great Apes, where 
they have entertainment chimps and orangutans. And actually, Michael Jackson's chimpanzee Bubbles resides there. So, and and a fabulous facility, and I highly recommend it if you if you are looking for a place to make a donation. The Center for Great Apes, Save uh, Save the Chimps in Florida, uh, Chimp Haven in in Louisiana, Fauna Foundation in in Canada. A number of my friends and some of my new friends now, uh, Kim in particular, uh, are are working hard to to try to change the lives of some of the chimps that I knew uh, from years. ago. Go that that ended up at the Fauna Foundation. So, I am talking to Bob Ingersoll here. Sorry to cut you off. He is uh, just a huge animal rights advocate, and we are talking about his travels right now. And again, he's uh, most commonly associated with chimpanzees. Um, what other are you? I don't want to. I don't mean to stretch out here, but other animals are you particularly worried about that are abused in this country? I mean, I understand chimps are they have a separate. A separate issue because they're so human-like that they get um, treated poorly in in the search for you know medicine and things like that. But are there other animals too that you're you're as interested in protecting? Oh, oh yeah, actually, I'm interested in protecting all animals, right? Not not just chimpanzees. Sure, I didn't. I'm, I myself am a vegan and mm-hmm. a, and I, I participate on a regular basis with a number of folks, friends of mine, the Animal Rescue Corps that that does pretty much predominantly dog and cat rescues they mm-hmm. they go to puppy mills they do as a matter of fact right now they're doing a, a, a an intervention let's say a, of a dog fighting uh, operation in Tennessee so uh, so I work really as closely as I can with a number of people that that work work on a number of issues and all different species. But you all have a common common ground too. Yeah, we all care about animals. Right. And and we all uh, come to the realization that that veganism and animal rights and and animal advocacy all, all go hand in hand and and why not work together it just seems to me that that it, it presents a more united front it, it, it shows the humanity involved in all of this and and it shows that we can actually work together that we're not let's say the fringe element or, right. or uh, we've been described as militant and that sort of thing and I, and I'm, I'm anything but militant I mean I, I'm militant in the sense that I want this stuff to happen but I want it to happen in the Gandhi uh, Martin Peaceful Luther way. King style you know uh, and it seems to me the best way to do that is to be friends so when you said that you um, at one of the previous rallies that you went to you guys staged a protest what did that entail what well, well what kind of we protest? did was uh, uh well alex actually and the vegans of uh st louis put this uh, put this together it it, it just uh it, it involved about 25 or 30 people getting together on a on a corner at uh, washington university in st louis and holding up a couple of banners that you can see on my website that that ask st louis uh, uh washington university in st louis uh, very politely to stop the practice of intubation, uh, uh, teaching intubation, uh, human intubation on babies on live cats, which for every everywhere else that teaches intubation uses dummies and newer techniques. Describe what intubation is real quick. It, it, it's, the, the, it, it's sticking a tube down a baby's throat in order to get it to breathe or because it's or to do suffering it. yeah, it's sick and right it needs it a born. medical okay. treatment of of some sort and so everywhere else that teaches this technique uses uh, a different form of teaching a, a different method of a, a, a actual a dummy a baby dummy a human baby dummy as opposed to a live cat and so i, I didn't know about this until i attended and and of course i'm, I'm like oh yeah I, I personally i think that 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 seems very reasonable that you'd want the most modern technique uh, available to be what's taught and and that's not what's going on so so that's that that protest I, I i actually participated in you can actually see a picture of me on on my facebook page holding up a sign saying i i think that's wrong and, right and it's america i mean it, right. the it's beauty com- of being in america is that right. protests are legal and, and 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 I think that uh, necessary. I mean, and still just as viable as ever. You know what's really interesting though is this is America. You can protest pretty much wherever, however you like, as long as you're not hurting other people. There are some exceptions, but it's interesting that we're still the country that uh, the only country left that uh, you know uses chimps in this manner. Like our protest. You know what I mean? Like uh, yeah. other countries have protesting laws where you can't protest, but yet they've come to the realization that. 
maybe we should stop experimenting on chimpanzees. Yeah, it it is a it is very strange isn't it, that that we can go out and protest all we want, but but in the reality, uh, what's going on that's obviously uh, something that should have changed hasn't, and uh, and unfortunately, sometimes uh, uh, sometimes the 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 protests aren't effective, and and, uh, and, and that's unfortunate. But uh, but I I think that that in in these cases. Most people understand that that this is a this this is the sort of change that needs to happen. Absolutely, um, we're going to go to a quick break here, just a quick song and a little PSA about smoking. And if uh, I see some callers on the line, hang on the line. I'll take your call. Uh, Bob Ingersoll is going to join us in a couple minutes after the break, and we are going to continue this conversation, get a little bit more into veganism and vegetarianism, which I am very interested in. And uh, I want to get his feedback on some news topics as well, but we'll continue this conversation. Thank you for listening to KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM. This is a message from the American Cancer Society. Colon cancer is the second leading cancer killer in the U.S. Colon cancer affects both men and women, and it can be avoided altogether by getting tested. Make your personal goal to get checked when you turn 50. That way, you'll have plenty of time to get to everything else on your list. Talk to your doctor about your testing options and call your American Cancer Society anytime, day or night. For a free information kit on colon cancer, contact Hope Progress Answers at 1-800-ACS-2345 or go to the website at www.cancer.org. That phone number, once again, is 1-800-ACS-2345. This message brought to you by the American Cancer Society and KPOO Radio. All right, back here with Bob Ingersoll, uh, animal rights advocate. And uh, we were just talking off air, and I should have just had that on the recording because that was an inter- interesting conversation. Uh, again, American Cancer Society, if you smoke out there, you should knock that off because it's not good. And uh, cancer is too big of a problem in this country, in my opinion. Another big problem is the mistreatment of animals, which Bob and I were just talking about. Uh, Bob, you brought up something really interesting, which was you said, I defend chimps. I mean, you defend all animals, but I defend chimps. I have it easy compared to certain people who are trying to stop factory farming, which is like that's like banging your head against a wall because there's just so much money and PR and all kinds of things fighting the other direction. I mean, I don't even know how you would... And it's packaged, so it's not really... It doesn't look like an animal oh, when you that's... pick it up in the store. <laughs> of course. So it's easier. Right. But, uh, uh, you know, my, my my friends and now some of my heroes are those folks like the folks at the farm sanctuary in Orinda. Uh, they take in cows and chickens and the animals that, that people eat. Uh, like I, like I was saying just a second ago, it's it's really easy for me to defend chimpanzees. How can you not like chimps? Right. Once you and, see and, one, you know, or right, and you, we don't eat chimps. But uh, like Karen Davis, for example, who runs United Poultry Concerns in New York, she has a giant sanctuary for chickens and turkeys and and, and uh, poultry. And how difficult is is it for someone like that to convince the public that they shouldn't eat? chickens or or that sort of thing very difficult and, and i i i like i said I, those people are my heroes I, the very difficult work that they do and and for very little reward but uh, other other than the fact that they get to hang out with those those animals that they they rescue and uh, i i think that's some reward for them but uh, but very difficult work uh, and it's easy for me I do want to get into this now since we've been talking about it but um i'm not exactly a vegan but it's uh pretty close. And the reason I got into it, well, first I I found out um, about it the way a lot of people do, which was through PETA and uh, a flyer. But uh, the thing that also caught my eye really quickly about veganism is it's like incredibly healthy for you. If you do it the right way, I mean, you can, the, the diseases that you'll avoid. I mean, I haven't had a cold, like a common cold in probably four or five years, and I'm not even completely vegan. I, I just basically stopped drinking milk. I don't eat animals too often. I eat fish occasionally, but um, 
Well, that's, and just that's also an animal. So. I know, I know, I know. But uh, uh, you know, I just got to jump in there. I know. Today, yeah. You know, that's so, what I said. I'm not completely. But, I'm a West Coast vegetarian, as one of my friends put it. Uh, yeah. I eat occasional egg and cheese, and uh, well, I, the health benefits obvious. Yeah. You know, I mean, no question about it. There are, are like huge health benefits to going vegan. Right. You just have to look at Bill Clinton from ten years ago and Bill Nearly Clinton died. now. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the reality is that it's pretty obvious. I, I don't necessarily do it uh, for the health reasons, although I, I reap the benefits. Right. I do it for the animals. Yeah. And, and the reason I do it is because I know the suffering and, and the trauma and, uh, and the, the, the misery that they go through in order, for, in order to end up a meal. And, and we have a choice. It's a choice we make, every one of us. And, and it's like religion. At, at some point you do, uh, you, you decide that, that you're going to be vegan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's something that I did as a vegetarian about 10 or 12 years ago. So you've been a vegan for 10 years. Yeah, over okay. 10 years, actually. But yeah. before that, you were a vegetarian. Like, when right. you knew Nim, were you a vegetarian then? Uh, no, I was not, actually. Okay. And uh, I I didn't actually become vegetarian until after Nim was sent away from the IPS. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, and I was given a talk about chimpanzees at a school in Oklahoma, at an elementary school, actually. And after the talk, a, a 9- or 10-year-old young man came up to me and asked me a really tough question. And, and this is what he said. Do you eat meat? And uh, I, I knew immediately what was going to happen, and I said, <laughs> yes, I do. And, and he said the next, next thing out of his mouth was, how can you talk about uh, caring about animals and, and having concern for animals when you eat them? Wow. And at that moment, I, I had one of those epiphanies that, that you have every once in a while in your life. And, and that kid was speaking right directly to me and, uh, and not to anyone else and uh, telling me that I needed to get it together if I wanted to continue to talk you know, on behalf of the animals. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, if I want to talk on behalf of chimps, then I have to talk on behalf of all animals, all of them. Right. It makes a lot of sense. Um do you know if that kid was a vegetarian or did he just uh, – Yeah, actually he was a vegetarian. <laughs> I'm not sure he was vegan because right. I, I, I imagine I probably wasn't as familiar with veganism as I am now. May not have even had heard the term like many people. Yeah, it's just – I mean it's, it's just now becoming part of the dialogue in right. the United States in terms of, of diet, and, and, and it's a good thing. I mean obviously – you know, here in that's, America, we have a di- we have dialogues about things that that are important, and that's one of them. What we eat. That's my point. Is that regardless of how you care, uh, if you care about the animals or not, it's simply just better for you to avoid or at least limit the intake of animal protein. Better for the planet as well. And, I mean, you yeah, know, exactly. in long term, right. you can feed a lot more people with vegetarian diet than you can on a meat-based diet. And right now, that's also a concern because, I mean, when it comes right down to it, everything's about money. I mean, saving the chimps is going to be about money and saving the planet, feeding the people. It's all about money and whether or not we're willing to spend it or not. Now, back to uh, I wanted to get your opinion on this too real quick because in the documentary Project Nim, one of the gentleman who's in charge of the uh, centers that is hurting them, that's doing animal testing on him, seems, I forget his name, but he seems essentially like he doesn't agree with what's going on, but yet he's kind of caught like this cog in the machine that just... Oh, you're talking about Jim Mahoney, Dr. Jim Mahoney. I think so. The veterinarian that that, uh, took care of Nim at Lemset before he left. Yeah, uh, I... Obviously, Jim's conflicted and was conflicted during that whole period of time. He was he started as a veterinarian in the and early now, 1950s, right? And so I, I think right at the beginning of his career, as a matter of fact, I know it because he's got a book out called "From Elephants to Mice," and he talks about it. And uh, the reality is that that he's a few years older than me, and 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 so philosophically, he wasn't able to make the leap that I did because it wasn't available to him. During that period of time, I'm glad that he was at that lab. Otherwise, it would have been someone else, maybe someone a little less caring. That's true. And so for me uh, to to dog him and, and to complain to him and really give him as much grief as I g- could until he came over from, let's say, the dark side to the light wh- was probably one of my – I'm proud of that, you know, because – and proud to be able to say that Jim Mahoney is – 
probably one of my best friends. And, uh, and, and that means something, you know, and, and, and to, to be able to shake hands and say, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we now are where we are is, is important to me. Well, I wasn't asking you to trash him or anything. I wasn't going to oh, yeah, say yeah. anything badly about him at all. But I, my question was, do you think all of these people, and clearly not all of them are, but do you think a majority of the people involved with animal research and vivisections and all that, do you think that they – that they're, you know, morally against it, but they just continue with it because it's their job. You know, are they, do they find it to be cruel? Are they looking at a bigger picture? What well, is, you know, I, I think that, and I want to give everyone that's in, involved in vivisection the benefit of the doubt. I, I want to believe that every single one of them really does believe that their work and is helping, and, and is helping whatever it is it's helping. I mean, obviously, those those things are changing pretty dramatically quickly. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's hard to find yourself on the wrong side of the knife, so to speak. And uh, I, I think there are a lot, lots of soul searching going on out there in research labs amongst scientists and people that do this research. I mean, it's fairly obvious the Institute of Medicine held a recently held a, a meeting where where this was talked about. I mean, so these issues are, are actually part of the dialogue that I think is very important. And and, and no, I, I don't think that those people doing research for the most part, 99.9% .9 of them are, are, are simply caught in a situation right. in, a, in a time frame that happens to be now. And, and you know, transitioning over from that research to a, a day when there won't be invasive research is, is difficult. And it's, and it's, it, it, it's taken a lot of soul searching on all of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we're paying for it. I mean, vivisection is paid for by our tax dollars. So the reality is that that it's going to be a public policy issue and something we need to deal with. Bob Ingersoll is my guest. We're continuing our conversation here. You're listening to KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM and KPOO.com. Thank you for tuning in. So um, – Let's let's talk about some of these big groups that are really – because to get any kind of change done in this country, there's huge opposition by big corporations, big groups. So you need kind of an organized group that can put up a fight. So who are some of these groups that you think are – people should check out and maybe get some literature on, potentially well, donate to? Well, a number of groups that are, that are working on the chimp issue right now are PETA, of course, and, mm -hmm. the, and PCRM, which is the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Okay. Uh, In Defense of Animals, IDA, right here in the Bay Area, also has a campaign to help the chimps. The Humane Society of the United States also has a campaign, as does the New England Anti-Vivisection Society. A and the, the group SANE, which is a much smaller group, uh, Stop Animal Experimentation Now, uh, smaller but pretty powerful in the sense that they get out there and get things done. So uh, I got to say that, that I'm, I'm in favor of any number of those groups. And the small ones generally to me seem to, you get the most bang for your buck. So, uh, so I, I highly recommend that if, if you want to interface with some of these issues, those groups are, are a good place to start. I mean, but it, just a starting point. Of course. And again, if you want to find Bob on Facebook, Bob Ingersoll, I N G E R S O L L. Right. I think on Facebook it's Robert Ingersoll okay. because my dad, he's way more into computers than I was. So uh -huh. he was on Facebook years before me. But and so he got Robert Ingersoll, I mean Bob Ingersoll. Oh, okay. So uh, a lot of people get my dad and wonder, <laughs> well, what's going on here? But but it's okay. My dad will point you in the right direction. He's been around this chimp thing for a while. That's and, great. And so, you know, he knows my, uh, he knows my deal. And uh, Nim Chimpsky, N I M C H I M P S K Y dot net. And also, we didn't even bring this up in our last interview, but um, the name Nim Chimpsky comes from the famous linguist Noam Chomsky. Right. The Harvard linguist, a philosopher, who's, uh, who's anti war a, activist. Who um, came up um, with that name? Was it the doctor yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Herb Terrace actually Herb Terrace. came up with that name, and and it's funny. Uh, it's obvious that that her, uh, Noam Chomsky is a, a play on the linguistic side of things. Right. But as it turns out, Herb Terrace was a student at Harvard in the in I don't know when I think the forties of B. F. Skinner, also another Harvard psychologist, and and the person who I I, I want to say is anti Noam Chomsky. So they kind of had a, a rivalry going on. Oh, okay. And so I think that that Herb kind of in, in a – you know, I think in science it, it wasn't done maliciously or anything, but I think it was one of those little ha-ha jabs. And so, yeah, and, and 
And I, I find it pretty humorous. Most people, when they see Nim's name, immediately, oh, Noam Chomsky, Nim Chomsky, ha, ha, ha. Has Noam Chomsky ever commented on it? Uh, no, I, I'm not sure. I think he has, but I think he pretty much dismissed it. I, 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 I invited him to come meet Nim at the Black Beauty Ranch. While uh, he was still alive. Yeah, while he was still alive. And unfortunately, that did not happen. That I, I would have been interested to see her. I mean, not her, but, but no. Noam and, yeah. and Nim interacting. That would have been and, and interesting. Then, and sitting around and talking to Noam about it later because, you know, I, I find Noam Chomsky. Really you smart know, probably, guy. Yeah, really smart guy. Way smarter than me. I mean, his deep structure and, and all the linguistic stuff is still, you know, it's still hard to figure out now after I've been reading it for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, you know, I find him, you know, one of those big brain guys. But, but sometimes, you know, you have to see it to believe it. And meeting Nim was one of those experiences that, that you, you don't walk away from going, yeah, yeah, that happened to me all the time. All right, well, we're going to go to a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll go over a couple news topics, and then I'll let you get out of here because I know you've always got busy stuff going on. And Sure. All right. Uh, you're listening to KPO of San Francisco, 89.5 FM. Stay tuned for the next hour because uh, Jay Johnson will be playing his blues house party. You're listening to KPO. <laughs> Breastfeeding has benefits that last a lifetime. Did you know that children who are breastfed have a lower incidence of diabetes, respiratory infections, earaches, and allergies than their bottle-fed counterparts? Breastfeeding lowers the risk of sudden infant death syndrome, hypertension, and obesity. Women who breastfeed have lower incidences of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and osteoporosis later in life. All in all, breastfeeding lowers your health costs and makes for a healthier baby. Breast milk is the best food for your baby, so breastfeed for better health for your baby and you. This has been a public service announcement brought to you by KPOO. Asthma is a lung disease. Asthma is chronic. In other words, you live with it every day. 17 million Americans have asthma. 5 million are children. Asthma causes breathing problems called attacks or episodes. An asthma attack is like drowning in air. In 2001, the National Medical Association declared asthma is a public health crisis for black people in America. If you have asthma, control things that make your asthma worse. Use your inhaler the right way. Have an asthma attack plan just in case. When preventing and treating asthma, knowledge is power. For more information on how you can help, call one 888-949-6767. 1-888-949-6767. All right. Bob Ingersoll is with me again. My name is Derek Keller. This is KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. Thank you for tuning in. We've been talking all about uh, this documentary, NIM, uh, Project NIM, which is going to be on HBO December 20th. I just want to let you know, too, in, a, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to be interviewing Alfie Macias, who's a uh, music program director at Out of Sight Art Center. We're going to be talking about uh, musical education, which I'm a big fan of as well. I used to play the saxophone, but I don't anymore, um, just because I wasn't any good. Anyways, I'll be joining him in 15 minutes. Uh, but, Bob, if you're ready, I just want to go over a couple news stories with you. We didn't get to talk about anything but the documentary last time I spoke with you, which was fun because I loved that movie. But um, I also imagine you have a lot of political and, uh, you know, ideas about the country and the world, and I just wanted to get your opinion. Sure. Okay. So this one everybody's been talking about, and I'm just doing it just to fit in, and I don't know if it's a big deal or not, but the uh, fiscal cliff, which we're talking about. The um, Republicans are using political math, people are saying, because they don't want to uh, – raise taxes on the wealthiest 2%, which I thought it was the wealthiest 1%. Everybody was focused on, but now it's 2%. So this number keeps oh, really? growing. Now there's 2% It's the 98%. rich people, not just 1%. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> the rich people doubled overnight? I guess Evidently. that's what happened, yeah. But um, Well, I, you know, the whole thing really kind of frustrates me like I'm sure it does everyone else that, that 
here in the United States, we can't just send some people to Washington and get it done. Right. You know, uh, that they go there and, and seem to have their own agenda or something going on, and they're not doing the people's work, it seems to me. Uh, somehow, some way, you know, it, it got done all the way up until, what, 20 or so years ago. We kind of figured out a way to work together. And, and about 20 years ago or, or so, it just – it seems to me that it all fell apart. Democrats and Republicans couldn't talk to one another anymore and right. couldn't, you know, Tip O'Neill and those folks, Ted Kennedy, and worked with the Republicans back then. It's – in my memory, I, I'm not a real – political person in the sense that uh, I'm, you know, trying not to get involved in all that. Mm -hmm. I I just want the country to, you know, everyone to be happy, everybody to get some health care, get fed, get housing. And and right now, those things are, are, you know, pretty bad off. Uh, We're, you know, how many people are homeless right here in San Francisco? I mean, it's it's a tragedy that shouldn't be happening. And some of those people are veterans. So to me, uh, you know, that whole fiscal cliff thing is like, come on. I mean, seriously, you know, I no, I agree with you completely. What they're saying is, you know, in about four weeks, we're going to reach this this uh, plateau of whether or not this thing gets fixed. And, uh, yeah, basically, uh, um, John Boehner, the House Speaker, is saying uh, we're not really interested in what the Democrats are saying. And the Democrats are saying, well, it's up to you guys to figure it out. So it does seem like a lot of political discourse. And I don't know what's going to happen, but just wanted to... Uh, you know, I, I bet they're going to find a way to fix this. It probably you know, and, and I hope that, that, you know, cooler heads will prevail and we'll stop being Republicans and Democrats well, everybody and start wants, being an American. Everybody wants to look like the hero that'll make this happen, so they all wait to the last minute. It's, it's going to take a lot of heroes, and it's going to take a lot of us to, you know, tighten our belts. Uh, right. You know, especially those of us that have, have resources. And I mean, you know if you have resources or not. Mm-hmm. And if you do, uh, you, sh- you should be grateful. This is an interesting story. I used to dislike being in uh, school when I was younger, as a lot of kids did. But five states announced Monday that they will add at least 300 hours of learning time to the calendar at at these schools. And those states are Colorado, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and Tennessee. Um, They're saying that more time of the more time with the students will make the U.S. schools more competitive on a global level. It's going to be a three year pilot program. It's going to affect about only 40 schools. Um, but as my uh, my friend, who's a teacher now, he's been a teacher for a couple of years, was saying, it's great for us because we get paid more. And I thought, that's not what it should be about. Because I remember as a kid, the eight hours I was there was making me go crazy. And I would have given anything to shave off an hour or two at the end of the day. And now they're adding an hour. And basically the money to pay for the you know teachers and whatnot is going to come from federal, state, and district funds. And there's people that are saying, uh, you know, not everyone agrees that shorter school days are the reason that our education system is and and people aren't being as as educated as they used to be. Um, They're they're pointing out countries like South Korea, Finland and Japan, where kids are there maybe half as long as they are at at uh, American schools. So I don't know if that's going to actually fix anything. I think the problem is when they get home from school, what's going on? Well, yeah, unfortunately, I think that that, that plays pretty heavily into, our, you know, our dysfunctional schools is our dysfunctional families. Right. And unfortunately, kids need to have supervision. They need to have parents that care. Yeah. You know, parents that read. Right. Parents that bring books into the home and that sort of thing. And, and you know, uh, you know, since I was a kid, things have changed dramatically. I'm not sure. Be uh, you know, I hated school too, just like every. I kid. didn't hate it, but it was. I would rather be anywhere else most of the time. Yeah, well, I I, I really <laughs> hated it. I, Did I, you? I, yeah, I I thought I and I man, baseball. Come on. You know, I right. go play baseball. Were you on like a high school team? Uh, you know, actually, no. I, I played high school football. For, oh, and wow. I also, you know, I'm kind of small for that. But and I, I played pony league and you know, mm. little league all the way up to okay. where I couldn't play anymore. So, you right. know, and unfortunately, uh, I'm small. So, and that at that time, baseball players were becoming huge. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I really started to like school when I met teachers that I liked. Right. That, that doesn't really happen good. Way later. It, too. Exactly. And, and I, I met met a woman uh, at, at the University of Oklahoma named Jane Lancaster. And college who, is different, but I'm, right. you know, public school. Right. But, you know, every now and again, and I went to a, a, a school in Izmir, Turkey, an American dependent school for, for military kids. And, and, and I'm now friends with a lot of my old friends from, from that school. And, and I think we'd all say, you know, equally that the reason why we got a better education 
education because those teachers were really engaged That's and true. really very interesting and were on top of it. So, I mean, I, I think it's a little bit of everything. Uh, we need to spend a little bit more time in the classroom probably uh, and spend a little bit more money on teachers and and supervision and, you know, all those things. I think personally, though, we're wearing – we're getting to a point where we could be wearing the kids' minds out because kids need to be like – a lot more engaged. You can't sit in the same well, seat for eight hours. It's just you, not you need work. to let them have music education as well. You need to have them sports. So all exactly. the kind of things that we've cut out of schools are the very things That's true. Exactly. that make school exactly. uh, exciting and a fun place to go to. And 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 it's it, it's not just one thing or another. It's the whole ball game. You know, you can't take out one or the other and still have have it function normally. I, I you know I I didn't wasn't very good at music either in school, but I took music education. I went to those, you know, I learned how to read, me, yeah. read music in, you know, as an elementary school kid and learned Latin in the third Didn't grade. I went to parochial school. So wow. that was, you know, but, but those are the kind of things that I think, you know, hone our skills in a way that, that kids just aren't, aren't being uh, challenged in that way because you know, we don't have the money or whatever, you know, and that's, that's sad. It know? is sad. Uh, obviously, if you were in the Bay Area this weekend, you had to deal with some wild weather. Uh, the last, I guess, storm, or however they say, the last portion of the storm hit Saturday night, and it ended, ended around noon the next day, dumped uh, four inches in San Francisco alone. Um, some manholes got uh, messed up, and nobody really, not too many injuries, uh, a couple of car accidents, some some downed trees, and a lot of people did lose their power. And in the East Bay, I lost some power uh, yesterday for a few hours, which was wasn't that bad actually, because the the weather had started to get a little bit nicer. Winds hit as hard as sixty miles an hour. Uh, like I said, there were some crashes, and none of the area's major rivers flooded though, which was good. And uh, the rain is expected to come back Tuesday or Wednesday, but it won't really be anything compared to this previous storm. And overall, I, I thought it was fine. Stayed yeah. inside most of the time, and. Yeah, we jumped out and did a few things when we could, went to the grocery store, that sort of we thing. We needed the rain you know, badly. Yeah, I, and, you know, I agree. Uh, everything was pretty dry, so it, uh, you know, a bit scary. Uh, yesterday, it was either yesterday morning or Saturday morning, pretty windy, and, and uh, kind of I, – I live on the hill there, Twin Peaks, and so uh, – it kind of blew pretty hard up there, but uh, you know, all it is in San all, Francisco too. Yeah, I mean, it's always blowing hard. You know, we uh, we survived it, and uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I'm glad it wasn't worse. A few years ago, there was one that uh, was pretty bad as well. So I, mm-hmm. I think, you know, I think I've been here seven years. I'm I'm kind of getting used to that. This part of the year is, is a little, you know. But you go back to Oklahoma too. Yeah, I actually go back to Oklahoma about once a month or so. Uh, My assistant, Caitlin, uh, uh, lives there and is finishing up at the University of Oklahoma. And so – and and she arranges my schedule and does a lot of things for me that that I can't do from here. Mm -hmm. And and since Nim is actually born in Oklahoma, we – try to do as many of our events as possible around uh, the town where he was born in Norman, Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma. And and so and it just makes sense to us. Plus, it's the center part of the country. We can – we travel together to other events. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I usually go to Oklahoma once a month or so. Uh, just one quick question. Do you ever drink Gatorade? I know you're vegan, but do you drink Gatorade? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. Well, that's good because Gatorade is under fire – uh, there's this new consumer petition that was just started. Um, someone figured out that one of the ingredients in Gatorade, which apparently isn't labeled on the side, but go figure, uh, it's an unhealthy ingredient. It's called brominated vegetable oil. I don't know if you've ever heard of that because uh, most people aren't aware that it's in food because it's generally used as a fire retardant. And uh, so some lady in uh, I forget where she's from, but the European Union essentially has already banned this from being in their food, um, and the United States still uses it. This woman has started an online petition. It's got about 200,000 signatures so far. Um, according to the Scientific American, BVO, or brominated vegetable oil, has been patented as, as a flame retardant and is found in some beverages, including flavors of Gatorade, um, and it's... it's uh, causing problems with breast milk and um, infertility and all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. I never, was, never heard, not, not aware. I mean, me obviously I've, I've had Gatorade in my yeah, life. I, was I don't normally it. drink it, but, but uh, wow, I, did, I wasn't aware of that, and uh, that doesn't sound... Uh, 
It doesn't. And, and, and yeah, unfortunately, our, our you know food is a really important thing, and for, for us to be able to know what's in it is is crucial. I think. I, I mean, think so we've too. We've had a couple of things on the ballot here in California I was recently. That, wasn't it thirty eight? Yeah, didn't yeah, pass. Didn't pass. But surprised. I, I think at some point when uh, when both sides get together and actually realize that hey, let's at least label what's in this stuff so we can make a, an educated you know choice. Uh, I'm I myself choose organic whenever I can. I always choose non-GMO when I can. Uh, it, uh, and I can't even explain to you why, but it just makes sense to me that, that uh, less chemicals are better. Right. No, I'm with you on that. A lot of people you know, say it's a waste of money or whatever, but I would rather just be safe than sorry. Yeah, me too. And I think that uh, eventually, if it's a waste of money, uh, uh, then that money's going into the economy anyway. Uh, somebody's getting it, and it's you know being recycled back in. I've always looked at it as you're casting a vote, saying I right. want health. And I was about to say that I think you know the the more I buy this, the more people buy it, the more it becomes the norm, and then the norm becomes cheaper. And you know, uh, so I, I personally, I, I think it tastes better. And I, I'm, Does I'm pretty? I'm convinced if you eat a, a conventional banana. And an organic banana mm-hmm. is there's no question that there's a difference. There's in taste. certain foods that are way more apparent. Uh, apples, right? A- a- like apples in, in particular. Mm-hmm. Uh, bananas, the fruits are, are you know tomatoes as well. Uh, tomatoes too, yeah. Farmers markets are the way to go. Yeah, I, I agree. And right here locally, uh, you know, right here in the Castros, ours. Well, Bob, I appreciate you coming back, and it was a pleasure talking to you again. Hopefully you'll come back soon, and we'll have more of your animal rights advocate friends on the show. They're always welcome here. Oh, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to have some of my friends from Fauna. Maybe we can do a, Please. a, 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 a group discussion. Yeah, I also yeah. wanted to do a, a group discussion one time about veganism with a couple, like maybe some chefs or something. I'll figure that out in the new year. But. Oh, that sounds great. I, I'd love to. Uh, and I, I love KPOO, and uh, I, I think it's a great thing. Uh, community radio doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, no. We should be proud of you. And, and this station. So, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for coming on. Again, nimchimsky.net, uh, Robert Ingersoll on Facebook. Um, and if you have HBO or know somebody with HBO, go over to their house uh, December 20th or any time that week because uh, Project Nim will be airing on HBO regularly. And uh, I'll be watching it. I have the HBO um, free trial right now for three months. Oh, excellent. All excellent. you have to do is call up and say, you know, I'd, I'm interested. And they'll go, oh, well, why don't you try the three-month thing? And that's well, all then all do. you guys out there should call up I your Comcast said that last and week. get your uh, HBO subscription. Whoever you have, uh, you need to always kind of call and threaten that you're going to go to another provider because they'll always – kind of give you treats if you just stay with them. That's what I've found. Right. Well, I, I actually have HBO, and, and I don't watch it a whole lot, but every now and again, actually, uh, I, I do tune in. And, and uh, if you know, after that, of course, you know, New Year's coming up. I'll see you at Further. Oh, right. Okay. New Year's run at the Civic Center. So, uh, as you know, you know, I'm into the dead as well. You so. are in the Grateful Dead, and I don't have any Grateful Dead coming up right now. But, you know, what I do have is uh, Michael Jackson because I just read that um, – Thriller just turned 30. Yeah, and so. that, that actually Caitlin will like that because uh, Caitlin's favorite artist is Michael Jackson. So I love the guy, one too. For, there's one for you, Kate. All right. Thank you, Bob. And uh, coming up in a minute, I am going to have Alfie Macias from the Out of Sight Arts Center. He is the music program director, and I can't wait to talk to him. You're listening to KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM.